UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. Today on UW360, what happens when you have 16 million items and no place to put them all? That's the problem for the Burke Museum and why they're building a brand new home. Plus, opening a locked door with just your fingertip and your smartphone. See how UW researchers are working to transform security as we know it. Also, turning an entire community into a classroom. The new program that partners UW students with city planners. And strike up the band and get a closer look at who's making music in the UW Symphony Orchestra. Hi everyone, from the University of Washington, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360. Did you know that the oldest public museum in Washington State is on the University of Washington campus? Fans of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture may already know that. The museum was founded back in 1885. And though it's not the original building, the Burke has been long overdue for a new home. And it's finally getting one. Austin Seedentoff gives us a sneak peek. Everyone knows the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. Since young naturalists began collecting artifacts in 1885, the Burke has been a place for people to learn about nature, geology, and culture. They had no idea that a hundred years later, those objects would be very valuable for their DNA. They had no idea. DNA had, no one knew about DNA. We preserve these objects for the purpose of them being used by researchers, by the general public, so that people appreciate the world and the habitat that we live in. The Burke wants to continue to make these artifacts available. And this one here is... But according to Executive Director Julie Stein, that has become increasingly difficult because their facility, built in 1962, is now showing its age. The lack of air conditioning is um, unacceptable for the objects. The swing in humidity is, causes them to shrink and swell. The baskets that we have absorb the moisture so fast they actually creak and pop. And the amount of space is gone. I don't know if you've walked down the halls, but all of the hallways are right up to the point where the fire marshal has told us, don't go further than this. Fortunately, the Burke is in the middle of building a brand new, 70% larger home for their artifacts. So that they can better expand and take care of their collections. And with a new entrance facing 15th Avenue, the new Burke will be more available to the public than ever. Literally on 15th Avenue yes. with the door facing University District. So this is where we'll have floor-to-ceiling glass that goes the full width of our lower lobby, uh, displaying whales, displaying uh, mammoth skeletons. And then one of the key design ideas of the internal building is just to make sure we can expose as much of the collections, as much of the research that happens currently behind the scenes, behind the walls that you can't see through to the public. So nearly every collection space, every lab is viewable. Um, and we've really integrated the experience so that the galleries and the lab and the collection spaces are right next to each other. They're not separate experiences. You get to see one while you see the other and you get to see the interplay between those two spaces. Construction on the new Burke is expected to end in 2018, but the hardest part of the project may be yet to come. Moving its entire collection of over 16 million items to the new building is going to take about a year. If all goes as planned with the construction and moving the collection, a newer, larger, more available Burke is expected to open its doors in 2019. The building should echo the mission. The mission is to take care of the objects, but make them available to people so that they can pull the information, pull the stories out of those objects. The 16 million items in their collection will be moved to their new home in 2019. And you can actually watch the construction live by going to the Burke's website. Still to come, get to know one of the toughest sports around and the UW women who play it. But first, imagine opening a locked door just by touching it. 
We'll talk with the UW researchers who are working on a whole new concept of security. Plus, the UW teams up with the city of Auburn to get students out of the classroom and into the community for some hands-on lessons. And celebrating more than a century of beautiful music with the University of Washington Symphony Orchestra as UW 360 plays on. The following UW 360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money. Welcome back to UW 360. It's no wonder we struggle to keep track of all our online passwords. Surveys show the average person has 20 to 25 different internet passwords. We use them to guard our websites, our emails, our bank accounts, even the entries to our workplaces, our classrooms, and our dorm rooms, which can all lead to huge security concerns. Now, though, two future engineers at the UW are working on a high-tech way to better protect us, right at our fingertips. Imagine what it might be like to unlock a door and open it Wait. merely by touching it. I mean, unlocking my door with my, my thumbprint would be pretty dope. I'd be down for it. Wireless technologies like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth use radio waves to communicate. Unchecked, they leave loopholes in security, making personal information vulnerable. Enter UW Electrical Engineering doctoral candidates Vikram Iyer and Murdad Hassar. Their mission is to turn sci-fi into science. What we're showing with this project is we can uh, transmit information through the human body. And that could include info on your smartphone, like passwords. Unlike other communication methods like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you have this unique layer of security. We have a laptop fingerprint sensor here that I'm going to touch with my right hand. The interesting part of our, our work is that we're using some kind of signal that is already on the device. So every time you use your iPhone and you unlock your phone, that signal goes through your body. We're doing nothing more than that. When you touch that fingerprint sensor, it's actually producing a signal that's coupling pretty well to your body. And so then all we're doing is we're putting a receiver somewhere else uh, uh, on your body and we're detecting that. By taking advantage of the low frequency signals emitted by fingerprint scanners and touch pads, messages can be encoded as a series of electrical pulses. You could take any series of letters and numbers and make that into some string of binary numbers, just ones and zeros, right? And that's actually what we're sending through the body. Because the passwords are not being transmitted as radio signals, the chances of someone hacking or listening in are greatly reduced. If you look at traditional communication radios like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, they're mostly designed to work in the range of 10 to 100 meters, which means everybody can eavesdrop on that signal. But in this case, if you go in the range of 10 to 20 centimeters away from the transmitter, you can barely receive any of the signal, which makes this system more secure. So are they really onto something, or is this just the stuff of comics and movies? We took an unscientific poll of those with their fingers on the pulse, UW students. I think that's a great idea, especially with the recent increase of just kind of password breaches and people getting access to your personal information. It sounds cool, but cool isn't necessarily the right thing. Then it's going to be a lot easier than trying to like find your keys when it's raining or something like that. You just touch your phone and you got it. For now, this sci-fi technology is still only in the lab, but in the future, What's next for us, uh, I guess from a research perspective, is trying to take this kind of technology and make it better. So for now, you'll still need to keep a close eye on all your passwords, but perhaps soon, all those secret codes could literally be right at your fingertips. Well, speaking of new things, when you think of a typical learning environment for UW students, you probably think of a lecture hall or a research lab. But how about a neighborhood in the city of Auburn? That's where some UW students will be learning this year, thanks to an innovative partnership with Auburn. As Stacy Sakamoto reports, it's part of a new program 
called Livable City Year. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for making the trip uh, down here to Auburn. This isn't a typical location for a class. There's three roads that come down Lee Hill, and we're on one of them. And this isn't a typical lecture. The city has a population of 77,000 people right now. But it's part of what some University of Washington students are experiencing as part of Livable City Year, an innovative partnership between the UW and the city of Auburn. Think of our model as a framework that solves the university community partnership puzzle. It'll give students a chance to apply what they've learned in classes to real world problems. You can't thank Auburn enough for saying yes. Sally Clark, UW's Director of Regional and Community Relations, helped kick off the program at a ceremony on campus. Auburn Mayor Nancy Back has told the crowd she can't wait for the work to begin. The opportunity to work with the University of Washington. I should have had purple on today. I'm a, I'm a proud Husky fan and I am just over the moon excited for what's going to be coming in the next year. First, a coordinator within the university and a coordinator at the city work closely together on every aspect of the partnership. Uh, my background is actually long range. Students and their professors will work with the city of Auburn on projects that include sustainability, water contamination, housing, homelessness, and community engagement, among other things. For some projects, students will be analyzing data. In others, they may be gathering information or developing marketing plans. It pulls from the entire university to serve projects that the community defines. As soon as the ceremony was over, Professor Brandon Bourne's class went right to work, meeting with Auburn city planners. Like I said, part of their historical boundary uh, is within um, the city of Auburn. The community environment and planning majors say it'll be valuable experience. It's really exciting for our class and a lot of fun for us to kind of get to work with community members directly. It's helpful for our professional development, but also to kind of gauge what kind of work we want to do after school. A few weeks later, the students were in Auburn, getting a first-hand look at the city's neighborhoods. But to actually drive through, listen to someone tell you about Auburn themselves, and to see things in real life, that was an amazing experience, something that planners need to do to actually go through the city instead of reading maps, looking at books, uh, reading articles. It's way better to see this in person. It's well connected by transit. Okay. Seeing it firsthand was really awesome to get a better idea of the geography of Auburn and um, how we can better implement our project ideas. UW administrators hope this will lead to livable city partnerships with other cities. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> Faculty and administrators are already so thrilled with the program that they're working on developing a livable city year partnership with another city next school year. Still ahead, strike up the band. We go behind the scenes of the UW Symphony Orchestra still going strong after more than a century of beautiful music as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. The University of Washington has a long history of making great music. Piano instruction was first offered in 1862 and music degrees have been offered since 1911. The UW also has one of the best kept secrets in the Seattle music scene, the UW Symphony Orchestra. It was founded in 1898 and it's still making beautiful music today. And you might be surprised to see who's in it. For the Martinu, I just want to go over a few things before we play. Each fall, David Robbie welcomes a new group of musicians. Don't worry about the sound in between. It can be dirty. It, it, it doesn't have to be clean in between. It just has to be sound. His goal? Take a diverse group of UW students and form a new symphony orchestra. One. We start every year kind of new, and that's why it feels a little bit like you're a football coach, because when you start out, you have to see what you have. What, what are the strengths? What are the things we can be able to do perhaps better than we did last year? 
Students from all across campus auditioned to play in the orchestra, from strings to percussion, from music majors to engineers. Yes, this orchestra is rather unique, offering any student the opportunity to make beautiful music. But we need to play yam, fa bam, fa bam, fa bam, less on the E. The instrument itself really spoke to me the first time I picked it up. I adore the instrument I play. I've never looked back. I always enjoyed playing in band in middle school. I always enjoyed making music with friends. It was just playing music and enjoying it that kept me playing tuba. I could not survive this quarter without music or the symphony. I need to have time with my instrument. You know, I don't want to forget that part of me. When I was in high school, I was applying to both universities and conservatories. I decided that I didn't want to pursue music full time, but I still loved it and I still wanted to play. It's fun playing with the non-majors because I feel like they're actually more passionate about it sometimes because they're here by choice, really. Um, I mean, as music majors, we love to play, but for a degree, we have to play. One, two. We would not have an orchestra if it wasn't for the students who come from all over the campus. Most of these students learned music when they were growing up. You know, they had music in high school, they had it around their house, and we're giving them an opportunity to keep doing that. That common thread, that love of music, is proven by the passion of both student and teacher. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Being part of an ensemble under the direction of someone who's so passionate about the knowledge and about the music itself, like, you really learn so much. You know, it's a class, right? We get a credit for it, you get graded, and he'll make it funny or serious, and I don't know, I learn a lot. And everyone is bringing something different to the orchestra their experience, their talent, it's, it's all different. So I try to unify it by trying to encourage people to do the best they can. I feel like music teaches us how to live life. It, it, it helps us learn about relationships with others. Uh, there's a lot of teamwork. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of feeling. It, it's just life. It really is life. The UW School of Music offers more than 100 music performances each school year. Most of them are free, and all offer wonderful music. Straight ahead, get ready to get down and dirty on the pitch. We'll introduce you to one of the oldest, toughest club sports at the UW, and meet the young women who play it. Welcome back to UW 360. The University of Washington offers some 40 different club sports for students, ranging from archery to wrestling. One of these sports is played by men and women of all ages and in more than 100 countries. Get ready to scrum as we meet the UW women's rugby team. It's a sport that's been played around the world for centuries. Husky men started playing in the 1960s, and in 2002, UW women took to the pitch. Pitch two, three, While rugby pitch is a club two, sport at UW, the women ruggers have risen quickly through the ranks of USA Rugby. I'm very competitive, and I love the challenge of bringing a team from a Division II lower level social team to a more competitive side, and so I'm really excited to see this team grow into that. My number one goal is just to teach rugby to more women and spread the game, spread my knowledge. The UW women play in the North Division of the Pacific Mountain Rugby Conference, along with WSU, Oregon, Oregon State, and Central Washington. One look and you can see just how physical this sport is. But it's about so much more than the scrum, hook, and maul. And I saw rugby and I was like, whoa, that's cool. They looked pretty friendly. And so I was like, why not? And then I told my mom and she was like, darn it, Alex. That's dangerous, but I did it anyway. 
Like it's more fun than I thought it would be because I thought I was going to be like injured all the time. But it's like oddly enough, like after you like just get up from tackling someone or if I'm on the ground, you're like smiling and you're like, hey, I'm fine. Like I just did that. That was cool. The camaraderie of playing together has helped UW women to grow as a team and as individuals. There's something special about the adrenaline and the running with, I don't, when you get the ball and make a really good run and get a lot of distance, there's something about that that just feels really good. And you have your, you have the whole line behind you the whole time and there's a lot, there's a big support system on and off the field and that's probably the best part about rugby. Threes will be right here with me. We got some tackling to do, it's gonna be fun. The support and dedication needed to be competitive provides life lessons that carry over to the classroom. I absolutely think that rugby provides these students with a mental toughness that they take straight into their college courses. They make arrangements to meet each other at the library. They're always spending time in study sessions. And so the foundation that rugby is giving them is creating a very, very strong mental capacity and they're taking that straight into their careers. And it's really been awesome. UWC! The old Five. saying, winning breeds success, both on Six, and off the pitch two, is center Six, stage. Two, but perhaps the larger reward is the sense of camaraderie and family wherever rugby is played. I mean, winning is nice, but honestly, if you get just like one like really good play, like one really good stiff arm, even if it's like, like two seconds work, you know, like if you just like hit that rock and then you like, you know you did it right and it felt good. This is like the little things that make up like, make the game so worth it. Hear this. Joining a team of ruggers is kind of like having a family wherever you go. Um, you know, wherever you go in the world, you'll find the nearest rugby team and you'll already automatically have a family. It's a really tight-knit community, and it's just the best atmosphere you could ever hope for for a team. Well, if you now have the urge to get out on the pitch, check out both the men's and women's UW Rugby pages on Facebook, and you can learn more about their schedules and events. And that does it for this edition of UW 360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.